trying to get the um What's your major? I'm slow but I got it. Oh, 
I'll miss that you were just supposed to. Hello, Dr. Jackson. Are you the real You want to see what's going on? That's right. Okay. Right here. Oh, but you got to see so you can speak from here. Yeah. But uh, can I close? Can I close that? Uh, oh, they want you over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, uh -huh. How are you? How are you? But how about some light to your heart? They're going to turn it up when it's time. When it's time. All right. Okay. Uh -huh. Sure. Right. Okay, so let me see about uh, whether there's room for uh, uh, Judge Bell. What are they going to do? Uh, room for Judge Bell for lunch, okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we got the witches to see it. Okay. We didn't know bells. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Ask. Okay. Should we take your coat? Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, you going to sit? And, and look. Okay. And, uh, and, <laughs> and let Bernie know. Uh huh. If you if you get them, pretty. You get them. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, that's important. Very okay. important. Okay. No, you're gonna you're gonna stay there. I'm gonna no, I'm gonna, gonna sit, sit there. down. Yeah, when it's when it's time, I will take you to the coming up there to join you as a speaker. So your PowerPoint. Uh, okay. If, you if you need me, I can do it. I need you. Okay, then I will do it. It's only seven slides. It's not that much. I will do it. Okay. Praise the Lord. How about that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you're one of the people who see it. Okay. All right. And then afterwards, you will be to have a seat back here for any questions. Is that correct? Did they put the mic there? They put the mic there. So I could, well, they're hand, handheld mics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's going to help us. We got to see you. Well, let me tell you something, Dr. Jeffrey. He may not stay. I asked him about lunch. He may not stay on because he is very conscious. Oh, yeah. He may not do that because he's got two masks. I don't know. And Brian is not able to come. He was 
taken down by the second shingle shot. Who was that? Brian Pettit. The one that you the oh, 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 Yes. A boot. Yeah. Hello, how are you? Hello there. It's nice to meet you. I have a message from Elizabeth Clark Lewis. So we will talk. We will talk. A surprise your back is full of lacerations in the heart. But I'm not preaching today, Dr. Shepard. I'm trying to keep myself in the lecture lane. That's what I'm trying to stay with. I promise you. You know what? The woman was fine. You know what? The woman was fine. I called to see what the wrong time was. You know the woman was fine. You kiss on Richard. Uh huh. Yes, it is. I can't wait to have so I'm going to do my best. But I'm giving space and work. So we all Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the seventh annual Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture in African American Female Studies at Morgan State University. We're very proud and pleased to be here on this beautiful day on the campus of Morgan State University, our national treasure, for the first time since 2019. Because of COVID, we were forced to cancel the 2020 lecture, and in 2021 and 2022, we held the lecture on Zoom via webinar. And today we make our triumphant return to Morgan, to our home base to pick up where we left off and to resume our in-person, up close and very personal Ruth T. Sheffy lecture. We are very pleased to have all of you with us this morning and we are especially pleased to see so many retired Morgan faculty and administrators and members of the Morgan State University women joining our current faculty, students in route <laughs> and on this special occasion. I'm Ida, Dr. Ida Jones, the Associate Director of Special Collections and Archivist at Morgan State University in the Richardson Library. It's my pleasure to preside today on behalf of Dr. Bernie Hollis, whose remarks he penned so graciously for me. 
Uh, the Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture is made possible by a very generous financial donation to Morgan State University Foundation by our distinguished alumna, Dr. Ruth T. Sheffy, who is a graduate from the class of 1947 of Morgan State College. This lecture is, in fact, a very unique event for Morgan. It is the very first endowed lectureship in African American studies in the 156 years of the university. It is the very first endowed lectureship in female studies ever established at Morgan, and it is also the first lectureship endowed by an alumna of the institution. So it sounds the gauntlet is down. Other classes need to step up. And it's the first endowed lectureship established in the names H. Gilliam Jr. College of Liberal Arts at Morgan State University. Many firsts. So this lecture is really an important moment for all of us, and we are so very pleased that some, many of you, including our president and our past president, have joined us here this morning and are watching us on YouTube. And in keeping with the purpose of this lecture, we are pleased to welcome them to Morgan today our keynote speaker, a scholar, voiceover artist, and navigational coach who is a founder and CEO of, oh, CEO of Bokasi Ventures, LLC, Dr. Laura Hargrove. We'll begin our program this morning with the singing of our national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, by Jayla Way, a soprano from the internationally acclaimed Morgan State University Choir, which is conducted by Dr. Eric Conway, Miss Way. And please stand as she sings the national anthem. I guess I'll let you use that one. <laughs> has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the Thank you, Ms. Way, for that uh, lovely rendition. To underscore the importance of this lecture as a permanent activity in the intellectual life of the university, we're honored to have three leaders of this institution to bring greetings. The first will be President of Morgan State University, Dr. David Kwabina Wilson. He is now in his 13th year of his stellar leadership to our institution which under his watch has been designated a national treasure by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and has been designated by the Maryland State Legislature as Maryland's preeminent public urban research university. He'll be joining us by Zoom and that's being set up. Followed by Dr. Wilson will be Dr. Jules White, an Anglo-Saxon and British Romantic literature scholar who is an associate professor and acting chairperson of the Department of English and Language Studies. 
He'll be followed by Dr. Adele Newson Horst, professor of English, who is the specialist in African, African American, and Caribbean women's writers, and the director of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program here at Morgan. Dr. President Wilson, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, and thanks to all in attendance this morning. Uh, as some of you may uh, know that uh, at the last minute, actually, I was asked by the Honorable Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, uh, to be a part of her delegation on her four or three country trip to Africa. Uh, I joined that delegation in Ghana uh, and literally just getting my way back uh, to campus, and so that's why I'm physically not on campus for this lecture. Uh, I do hope to be there this afternoon during a part of the luncheon. Uh, but I do want to thank all of you for joining us uh, both in person and virtually uh, for the seventh annual Ruth T. Chetty Lectures Series uh, in African American Female Studies. Uh, I welcome all of you to really this very important space uh, where a necessary and sometimes often difficult conversations transpire. You know, the recent national and global events, uh, they remind us that if we do not remain vigilant, uh, if we don't stay true to these causes, that sexism in our world can indeed advance uh, and we cannot stand to allow that to happen. And so it is most appropriate that Morgan State University's celebration of Women's History Month culminate with the annual Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture Series. Women have embodied excellence on the campus of Morgan State University, our national treasure, as early as the fall of 1874, when the first female students enrolled at Morgan. I would unapologetically declare on today that you cannot find a finer example of Morgan State University womanhood than the extraordinary life and the living legacy of our legendary and incomparable Dr. Ruth Turner Sheffy. Our Dr. Sheffy is indeed in very, very elite and exclusive company. When you consider scholars all over American higher education, you will be hard pressed to indeed find anyone in higher education who has labored in the vineyard for 62 consecutive years at the same institution. Let me say that again. Dr. Ruth Turner is served on Morgan's faculty for 62 glorious, 62 tremendous, 62 phenomenal, and 62 transformational years. She is indeed the longest continually serving faculty member in the history of Morgan State University. Those of you who are so pleased to join me in saluting Dr. Ruth Turner this morning. And if that was not enough, what you heard already is that in 2014, Dr. Sheffy made history by establishing this endowed lectureship series in the Gilliam College of Liberal Arts, the only endowed lectureship series in the college. Thank you very much again, Dr. Sheffy. We are most grateful to Dr. Sheffy not just for 62 years of service to our faculty, not just for endowing the lecture series in African American female studies, and not just for the poetic artistry in which she penned the Sesame Centennial poem, but we are most grateful to Dr. Sheffy for her example, for her example of unselfish and unwavering commitment to this institution. Since Dr. Sheffield's arrival on Morgan's sacred campus in the early 1940s, she has loved the fair Morgan faithfully. And on today, on the occasion of your seventh annual lecture series, 
Be fully persuaded, Dr. Sheffy, that your love for Morgan is reciprocated tenfold. Thank you, Dr. Sheffy, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do for this institution. It is my sincere hope that our students, faculty, and administrators strive on this campus every single day to emulate the sterling example of service that you have lived for us. And so on today, I welcome all of you, including those of you who have joined us virtually to the seventh annual Ruth T. Chevy Lecture Series. Here at the National Treasure, there is no space for racism, there is no space for sexism, and there is no space for any ism as a national conversation ensues around these issues. And the so-called pillars of power would have the audacity to try and strip women of hard won rights in this nation. I want those of you assembled to rest assured <laughs> that we here at Oregon, uh, we are boldly invested in women empowerment. Uh, understand that we at Oregon, we celebrate, we honor, we acknowledge the accomplishment of women, not only during the month of March, but every day of the year. All around this campus, our physical plant serves as a constant reminder of the contributions of women, and especially women of color. My office is housed in a building named for Sojourner Truth. When you exit the front door of Truth Hall, you look across our historic academic quad, and the first thing you see is Harriet Tubman House, and then Francis Ellen Parker House, and then you venture across East Coast Spring Lane, and you cross the Verna Welcome Bridge. You may know that Senator Verna Welcome was a graduate of Morgan College, class of 1939, and she was Morgan's, or Maryland's, first African American state senator. And we owe a lot to her because it was Senator Welcome who authored the legislation that elevated Morgan from a college to a university in 1975. And then upon crossing the Welcome Bridge, one comes upon Cummings House, which honors the legacy of Eliza Jane Cummings, uh, who was the primary fundraiser for Morgan's former West Baltimore campus, and her daughter, Ida Rebecca Cummings, the first female to serve on Morgan's Board of Trustees, and Baltimore's first African-American certified kindergarten teacher in our city. And then immediately behind Cummings House is the Wolford Infirmary, which honors Harriet Wolford, the dorm matron who literally gave her life saving 75 students from a dormitory fire in December 1917. What I'm saying is that here in Morgan, we honor, we respect, and we celebrate women and their contributions to humanity. As president of this great university, I am most proud of the historic representation of women among my senior leadership team. All of the new buildings that you see on this campus, starting with the CBIS building, which houses the School of Architecture and Planning, have been overseen by Kim McCallum, $1,100,000,000 of construction on the campus. And Morgan, you're not only concerned about diversity, inclusion, and safe spaces for all of our students, but we also endeavor to pursue and provide the same for our faculty, staff, administrators, and surrounding communities. Indeed, of the top 100 leadership positions at Morgan, 50 of them in my administration are held by women. And so again, I thank all of you for joining us today on this important occasion. 
I am very excited uh, to uh, hear of what Dr. Hardwell has to say. I'll be taking the train back to get on campus in about an hour, so I will be listening. And I welcome all of you again to Morgan State University, the National Treasure. We're here. Uh, we are not confused. Uh, we celebrate the contributions and the legacies of great women like Dr. Ruth Turner Chaffee. Thank you and welcome. Dr. White, if you can ascend, and then Dr. Newsenhorst after. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Ruth T. Sheffy annual lecture. Dr. Sheffy, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, Dr. Hargrove as well. So I, I will be short and sweet with this. I want to thank Dr. Sheffy for not only having the lecture series, but also for her scholarships, which are they're all of a, in a package. So she's enabling uh, students to continue with their studies, even through COVID and so forth. And I want to um, thank Dr. Johnson and Dr. Hollis also for organizing this. So with further, um, without further ado, as they say, uh, Dr. Hargrove, I think, or Dr. Sheffy. Oh, okay. Dr. Newsom for us. Take it away. Good morning. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the women, gender, and sexuality studies program housed in the James H. Gilliam Jr. College of Liberal Arts, I am delighted to offer greetings. One of the research foci of the program is the restoration of black women, literary and historical figures. Uh, the idea is to rescue them from obscurity in an effort to combat erasure. We both recognize and honor Dr. Ruth T. Sheffy as a veritable now, uh, model of this endeavor for leading the charge here at Morgan State University. Her scholarship on women writers, her mentorship of students both at Morgan and outside the institution, her heartfelt teaching and her enthusiasm for literary studies elevates her to the level of legend in the Department of English and Language Arts. Briefly, on a personal note, I met Dr. Sheffy while I was a graduate student at Michigan State University. Her annual conferences attracted students and faculty from all over the country and abroad. Immensely approachable and helpful, she later wrote the foreword to my book on Zora Neale Hurston. Thank you, Dr. Sheffy, for being the inspiration that I did not have at Michigan State University. Additionally, I would like to thank Dr. Bernie Hollis, Dr. Annika Simpson, and Dr. Julie Conger for the wisdom to initiate Morgan's Women's Studies program in 2009. The mission of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program is to educate Morgan students about the importance of gender equity, to promote critical thinking about the role of gender across all disciplines and in all areas of our lives, and to provide analytical frameworks for the examination of gender, race, ethnicity, class, ableness, and sexuality. I'm proud to say that our program continues the work of Dr. Ruth T. Sheffy. Thank you. Oh, sorry. 
Thank you so much, President Wilson, Dr. White, and Dr. Newsom-Horst for those kind and encouraging words, as very well personal words on this occasion, which is one of the culminating activities of Morgan's 2023 Women's History Month celebration. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the occasion will be given by our benefactor and the creator of the annual Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture. I will introduce her simply by saying that Dr. Ruth T. Sheffy is a Morgan legend. She's the graduate of 1947 from Morgan State College, and I will abbreviate that there because she's coming to the microphone. Dr. Sheffy. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jones. You all get to be legends, just have to get old. <laughs> well, but I've been educated myself this morning because Dr. Wilson has told me some things that I, you know, didn't know about the buildings here on campus. So uh, that was a lovely... Uh, can they? Uh, yeah. I'm all right. Uh, that was a lovely education for me. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. And uh, it's just overwhelming to me that uh, uh, we have here with us today, just warms my heart. Uh, so many people I wanted to talk about, you know, um, when, you, when you work in one place for 62 years, you gather around you lots and lots of friends and some enemies, of course. <laughs> so we know that. But it's just overwhelming to me because those 62 years of work were not like work. I was always amazed when uh, some of my other club members were so eager to get to retirement age. I wasn't eager to do that because I loved what I did every day. If you love what you do every day, you won't work a day in your life. So those 62 years just ran by. And I can't go on with the other things I wanted to say without saying how overwhelmed I am that we have with us today just distinguished, uh, remarkable graduates of Morgan and graduates of my classes here at Morgan. I didn't know that Judge Robert Bell would be with us today. I taught Robert Bell, yes. And I'm just so proud of him and of so many of them that I've taught, so many of you uh, that I've taught. So it's, it's just a, a heartwarming to feel that. Well, this is really a beloved community. It's Martin Luther King's beloved community, warm family. Um, Zora Hurston came to Morgan to the preparatory school for girls. You might not have had one. In 1917. And she said in 19, she wrote that when she came to Morgan in 1917, she found an embracing, loving community. That's what I found when I came as a freshman in 1943 a loving, embracing community, a, a just larger family. But the important thing was that people who believed you had no promise, no come, but people who believed in you, who didn't give you any silent messages of uh, uh, ineffectiveness or uh, that you couldn't learn or and it, not, none of those messages came. The messages were all warm messages that you can be anything you want to be. You got to work at it. You have to work hard. But you can be what you want to be, vice president, president perhaps. So that 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 was the community that Zora described that she came to. She came with no money and nothing. And the girls used to compete to lend her dresses, she said, to go to parties and whatnot. So that, uh, and she worked, and they got her job in a trustee's house. Uh, and later in 19, here at Morgan in 1984, we found it with some uh, interested members in the English department, the Zora Neale Hurston Society, and then published the forum up to about 20, 2010, something like that. So that uh, when people were saying in 1984, many of them, 
even after Alice Walker thought she found the grave, uh, Zora who? Now she's a household word, New York Times and all that all the time. But all right, so that I wanted to welcome all of you and to say how delighted I am that Reverend Hargrave, Reverend Dr. Hargrave is going, Hargrove is going to speak to us today. Uh, I guess it's a kind of family gathering because Judge Bell must know her father. Uh, Judge Hargrove, who was an important Baltimore judge uh, for a long while, but she's uh, important in her own right. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> like Zora, I found this to be a special place where the everybody encouraged you. Everybody made you feel that you were special and that you could do anything you wanted to do. Uh, and, and that was a good, good thing. Uh, I entered Morgan as a freshman in 1943. And there, there was such a year, <laughs> a long time ago. That was a long time ago. But I found the same uh, setting. And so I want the students to know, I want you to know that you've made a very, very special selection. And the faculty is very carefully selected so that even if you're faculty, new or old, you didn't just land here. You're supposed to be here and you have a mission and, uh, and you're to care about the students. Uh, we, some people have to be encouraged to keep their office hours. You ought to regard it as a, a privilege because many of your students have difficulties that they cannot speak out in class but they'll come to your office and sit with you and tell you, and you can understand then what their needs are, why they do what they do, why they say what they say. So those office hours are important, but all right. So that <clears throat> this, this funding for this lecture series is in the hope that you will be, we, we say it's Women's Month, but we celebrate women all year here, Morgan. <laughs> but, but, uh, that you'll be encouraged, you'll be encouraged to be your, to give your very best, to give your very best. And I have the great benefit of seeing what Morgan can do for you. You know who you are now, but you're the students, you don't know who you may become. But we have here, we have uh, Judge Bell, Robert Bell, who sat in my classes some years ago. Judge Robert Bell, we have uh, Bernie, where's Dean Bernie Hollis? Dean Bernie Hollis was a student too at one time, but <laughs> he, he's been the breathing life and all of that. I call him, I call him <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Simon, the Serenian, the black, man who carried that bloody cross up the hill to Golgotha. He's done that for Morgan. He's carried that, that cross for Morgan in many, many ways. And we, but he sat in my class at one time. So we, we appreciate that. Well, so that this, this, this lecture exists in the hope that it will bring to students. We've got a lot of important folks here. I wish we had more students because it's designed for the students. And if you'll read, they put my, uh, Dr. Wilson was gracious enough to make me poet laureate for the sesquicentennial. And they put those, those three sonnets on the beginnings of Morgan and then the progress of Morgan, the now future hopes. And they're in your program. If that last sonnet is dedicated to the current students. It's for you. It, it lets you know that we expect you to give your very best and that you'll come back to Morgan as these people I have mentioned, so many I, I, I have, couldn't call all the names, uh, who'll come back to Morgan to give to Morgan what we've given to you. Uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> we honor then these, uh, these resources, the sources of courage and hope. Uh, that we get from women, uh, the women who have encouraged us. I know that uh, COVID has taken from us 
some close people. I've talked to people who lost grandmothers who said that they were doubling down their efforts to do better in school because those grandmothers expected it. And it's true. We do expect a good bit of our children. My granddaughter is here, and I'm very proud of her. Um, Dr. Renata Afi Rawlings Goss. Where's Afi? Stand up, Afi. <laughs> She's lecturing tomorrow at Brown. She's PhD in, uh, in astrophysics, I think it is. Uh, you know, English teachers don't know a lot about that. But anyway, <laughs> so proud of her. And her brother, uh, Michael, is on a job today. He couldn't be here. And he's a PhD in uh, materials engineering. So, um, you know, and then their mother grew up on this campus. Alona grew up on this campus. And where is Alona? Is Alona? Oh, no. Okay. That's Alona. She grew up here. She... She, her law degree is from Yale. And so uh, they, they've done well, but so many. They're just my own blood people. But you can't imagine the joy I have when you send me your books. You write books and you devote chapters to Morgan and you talk about your teachers and mention me sometime. And it's just, and you visit me. Um, we have a, from my writing class, a Pulitzer Prize winner, James Allen McPherson. And uh, Terry Edmonds was the chief of staff, Clinton's chief of writing staff, chief of his staff of writing, a black Morgan graduate uh, out of my writing class. So that I'm, I'm going to stop here now because we came here to hear. Uh, but you know, when you get older, you, you tend to uh, recollect and you go on too long. So you'll have to forgive me for that. But in any event, thank you for being here. Um, you're in a very special place. Morgan is just special. And you'll feel that through the years. And you'll feel that as you, you go on. Uh, Today, you're going to hear um, from uh, a young lady who is going to encourage you, as all of our speakers have. This, this lecture was funded in the hope that that would happen. And I'm going to stop now and uh, let you hear, uh, be honored by our distinguished speaker, um, Reverend Dr. Laura Hargrove. Thank you for coming and love to you all. Success to the students. Thank you, Dr. Sheffy. As always, profound and eloquent as usual. And thank you for being one of the finest examples of the impressive graduates that you've mentioned that Morgan has produced. And once again, thank you for your many years of service and continued inspiration to all of us. I won't be before you very long. I'm going to probably take this out because she wants to go handheld as well. So I apologize for the distractions. So I'm going to introduce the speaker. I am very pleased and quite honored to introduce our guest speaker for the seventh annual Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture, for she is clearly, in fact, the embodiment and the manifestation of the goal of the Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture Series, and to quote, to provide a foundation of courage and emotional security for African American youth, and to cause them to remember the sources of hope, self-respect, resilience, and endurance that fortified their ancestors. For all of her professional life, Dr. Laura Hargrove has been a strong advocate and crusader for promoting our shared humanity and for uplifting marginalized people by providing them with the foundation of courage and emotional security of which Dr. Sheffy speaks. With a bachelor's degree in communications from Howard University and a master's of divinity degree and a doctorate in homiletics, from Wesley Theological Seminary, and now a doctoral candidate for the degree of PhD in African Diasporic History at Howard University, Dr. Laura Hargrove has been one of the nation's strongest and clearest voices calling for unity, shared humanity, and peace in a country and a world in dire need of them today. 
Dr. Hargrove has been a courageous and undaunted spokesperson for our spiritual and relational health as one whose wise counsel and expertise have solicited by has been solicited by leaders in health, education, cultural training, and government, including the former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings, and our current governor, Wes Moore. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to bring to you Bokasi, and it's in your program what that means, the unique energy and presence of Dr. Laura Hargrove, a native Baltimorean, founder and CEO of Bokasi LLC, as our seventh annual Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture in Female Studies. Maybe we'll change that to Women's Studies, maybe. Um, and let us greet her with a warm Morgan welcome. Dr. Dr. Hargrove. Yes. Good day, everybody. Uh, I had to look around me to see who she was talking about. I have to get the notes on that introduction because that sounded really good. That sounded that sounded <laughs> excellent. Let, let me just give uh, a round of thanks to Dr. Hollis for his assistance in preparing for this lecture. I'm sure I worked his last nerve, but <laughs> I am so glad that uh, we are here in this place today. And certainly we want to give honor to President Wilson, to past president, Dr. Richardson, to um, Dr. Jones. And uh, I, I must certainly thank Dr. Sheffy for granting me the honor of being this year's lecturer. Don't want to leave out anybody, but everybody that was on the program that spoke into our wonderful soloist, Miss Way, that started us off with your melodious voice. We thank you for setting the tone for us today. Now, he's already been mentioned, but I must give my honorable mention to the Honorable Robert M. Bell, the retired Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, former student of Dr. Sheffy's, and my my uncle judge. I want to also give uh, props to his kindergarten classmate and Morgan Knight, Dr. Clara Carter, my aunt Clara. And we thank God for being in this place for those that are here in person and for those that are watching virtually. Good day to each of you. Now, though I am a Howard grad, Morgan State University did help me to get there because while I was trying to push my way through Howard, this was the only place during the summer I could take economics and get through and pass. So we thank God for that. The title of this lecture today is It Is Well With My Soul, Black Women, Culture and Spirituality. When historians get up and speak, they normally talk about they and what those individuals have done and are doing, but I am an inclusive person, so I'm gonna include my own self in this, so it is going to be our. Black women, we have such a rich cultural and spiritual history that is undeniable, but it did not manifest itself without a struggle. As people of the African diaspora living in the United States, we turned our struggle into strength that was born out of enslavement. Our collective spiritual DNA as a people has guided us to turn that struggle into strength, strength into perseverance, perseverance into power, and we use that power to tap into and encounter the spirit in the ways in which are meaningful for us. And that looks different for each of us. Before we were forcibly brought to these shores, the spirit was already residing in us. It was not something that another culture had to come in and give us, teach us, or show us. And despite other people's narratives of people of African descent, we did not need anybody else to give us a history because it used to be that they would tell us that we had no history of our own, which 
just is not true. We had a history that was stolen, suppressed, and denied. A history of genius that Europeans and other factions claimed as their own. The God connection was already existing on the continent in the form of African traditional religions and eventually melded with Christianity, melded with, with the Muslim tradition and other spiritual practices. The beauty about what we do as black women is that we take the lead oftentimes to set the tone for the spiritual practices, not just for ourselves and our households and our families, but for our community. The struggle that I speak of, it cannot be denied as a part of our collective past as black women or part of our present. You see, assimilation with the dominant culture and that dominant culture that ain't so dominant anymore certainly played a role in our culture and spiritual evolution. And we as black women have always clung to the resistance that is within us. Resistance as power in some form or another in order to meet the challenges of the day. Resistance has showed up in enslavement. It has showed up in civil rights. It has showed up in the Black Power Movement. It has showed up in every facet of our journey. Resisting the narrative of other. Resisting being told how and who we are to be. Resisting the urge to give up and quit when we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We can always find a way to create space for our own awareness and self-worth in the face of adversity because it allowed us to hold on to strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. It is what Actually, we can keep on going. It is what Dr. Thavolia Glimpf illuminates in her thought-provoking work entitled Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household. And in it, she shares her insights about the power of enslaved Black women during the Civil War and after their emancipation. The circumstances were less than ideal, to be sure, but Black women have a nuanced way of speaking truth to power, speaking truth to the power of the collective horror and tragedies that we have experienced. We don't sugarcoat much, but rather by drawing on our innate dignity, grace, and grit all mixed together, with our authenticity allows us to be able to take hold of the mantra, it is well with my soul, no matter the circumstance. Now we do not say it's well because the circumstances are so wonderful all the time, but we claim well because we have always known how to tap into the spirit within. We call it different things. Some people call that spirit God. Some people call the spirit spirit, supreme being, Jesus, Allah, Yahweh, divine energy. We express it differently, but the essence is the same. That does not mean, nor has it ever meant, that we purport delusions of grandeur in difficult times. It does mean, however, that we find a way to thrive within in spite of. The black women of which Glymph speaks suffered more harshly at the hands of their white female mistresses than the slave masters themselves. We don't know about it so that we don't talk about it. 
about the fact that while the Civil War was raging on and slaveholding husbands were on the front lines of the battlefield, their wives were left to manage not just the household, but the plantation as a whole. We have this notion that has been purported that there were field, fill in the blanks, and house, fill in the blank. And we have this notion that those of us that were in the house had it better, had it easier, and had nothing to do or com in comparison to what was happening out in the fields. Again, nothing could be further from the truth because white mistresses seized the opportunity to punish the black women their husbands had been living out their sexual fantasies with by force. Not only were they raped at will, but when the masters were gone, enslaved black women were violently and brutally beaten by their white female counterparts much more harshly than the slave master. Glimp explains, and I quote, violence on the part of white women unleashed on enslaved black women is hidden in the shadows of history. She continues by explaining that the role of the mistress in the daily execution of that power has been grossly undervalued as an integral investment on the part of the mistress to enforce slavery and white supremacy, and we see the residual effects of it even today. Her book also deflates the notion that after the war, formerly enslaved women sought to model themselves after white America's domestic exemplars. Nothing could be further from the truth. Glimpf rightly argues that enslaved women sought their own selfhood, separate and apart from the standards and values held in high esteem by white women. Why is this important in this venue today? Because I believe it's critical to understand some of the roots of our culture as black women in this country to have a better grasp on embracing where we are today, especially when it looks differently on others than it does on you and how you choose to express it within yourself. Now, let me be clear on what I define as culture. I'm talking about a shared set of values, ideas, concepts, even unspoken rules of behavior that allow black women to function and to rep or reproduce ourselves. It is about our individual and collective embrace of selfhood. However, the selfhood that we embrace does not mean that we become cookie cutter versions of each other. It means being your best self, bringing the best of who you are into the forefront of your world. It means that we understand our cultural nuances with each other enough to let our own light shine without dimming someone else's. In other words, it allows you to stand all the way up in who you are without the need to throw shade at your sister or show th throw shade at your brother for that matter. Our cultural culture of the past has helped to create the current culture of black women. How we show up in our selfhood, how we effectively engage, not just with our white female counterparts, but with ourselves, our black brothers, our children, and our community at large. Our culture as black people on these shores is consistent with the African-centered philosophy of community over and against autonomy. There are always exceptions to that particular cultural rule, but we live our selfhood in relation to others, even when tensions are at play. But I would submit this to you. It begins with theology. Your theology or your God talk, your higher power talk, informs your 
anthropology, how you see others. And your anthropology informs your sociology, how you order your society and your world. Even in moments when it, whatever your it is, is not well with your soul, all of that is at play. How it is that I see God, if I see God or my supreme being as one that chooses one over another, it is going to affect how it is that I see other people, myself up here, you down there, myself down here, you up here. And it affects how you order the world in which you live. Historically, we have minimized the violence of white women on black women. Our importance has been historically downplayed, while the over-exaggeration of black women's strength has been perverted by the dominant culture and laid upon us, laid out to be something other than human. We are made to be something other than human, a being without the full range of emotions, a being that feels physical and emotional pain at a much lesser degree than others. But we are in the humanistic sense, just like everybody else, but those ever prevalent portrayals of us in the broader culture pressures us towards a self-fulfilling prophecy at times and the notion of strong even as we look our, at ourselves as strong instead of fully activating the black girl magic that is within each of us. We can miss the mark by denying the full capacity of our selfhood mess around and suppress our own worth and devalue the uniqueness of who we are created to be. It is only well with my soul when I reject a revisionist narrative of who I am as a black woman and who we are in the culture of black femininity. Now, I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking about being a feminist. I'm talking about embracing our femininity. It has been made to be almost a taboo that we've got to show up like the brothers, walk like the brothers, act like the brothers, but that is not how you were created to be. And it is a place that we find ourselves in where we need to begin to embrace who we are and be proud of that, however it shows up. If it shows up with you being she, her, or they, them, or something in between, to embrace it and be all right with the gift of femininity that has been given to you. We live in the remnants of all of these things. The Karens in our midst, the cry wolf, the microaggressions that show up in the realms of education, healthcare, and through social media and other arenas that are supported by conscious and unconscious bias and the struggle for it to be well with my soul when I am quietly and not so quietly striving against my black sister because even if we have not bought into the narrative of other for ourselves. We buy into it for her, with her, and about her. Know this, we hold a particular historical presence, relevance, with our spirituality and culture that bind us together and open doors to create the fire and the freedom to be who we desire to be as we are connected to the source of our cultural and spiritual understanding. As black women, your narrative matters, no matter how well-known you are, 
or how obscure your presence might be to a larger world because every woman's story matters. Black women, your story, the nuances of cultural influences as they move in tandem with spirituality, they are rich, they are varied, and they are opulent. But regardless of what others think about you or your story, you've got to find yourself in a place embracing selfhood so that however it is you show up, you stand in that authenticity, you own it, and you work it. Work it to the benefit of yourself, Work it to the benefit of your community. Work it to the benefit of you moving forward and making space for your own self in this world. To be clear, your spirituality is not your religious association or practice, although it can show up in those spaces. Your connection with the divine presence and how you live it out culturally is something that is a little different. You see, as we look back over our collective cultural spiritual history in the United States, it aligns with how the late Dr. Gayrod Wilmore, who penned Black religion and black radicalism and interpretation of the religious history of African Americans put it. He called African American religion a tertium quid, not purely African and not purely American, but a third entity unto itself. Wilmore suggests that the emergence of black American religion culture becomes that third entity. It is not just in religion though. I would suggest, I would submit to you that we as black women create a tertium quid wherever we go. We make things our own through the melding of our culture and spirituality. I would submit that black women throughout the African diaspora have consciously, creatively, and consistently been cultivating a tertium quid for there for our blackness that shows up in the academy, it will show up in the mosque, it will show up in the church, it will show up at the hairdresser, it will show up at the nail salon, it'll show up in the corner office, it will show up in realms of entertainment, and it will show up in love. And however and wherever we have been dispersed, whether by force or by choice, we are deliberate. That is how through our very existence we connect with our selfhood, always creating and recreating, creating and recreating so that even when we encounter the less than ideal circumstances that life is sure to bring, we don't linger too long in the spaces of muck and mire, so to speak, until we do something about it so that we can arrive in the safe space of knowing that it really is well with my soul. The great hymn of the church by the same name was written not in circumstances of joy, but in times of stress and struggle. It is well, not because circumstances are always well, but because of the rich culture that we share, because of the spirituality that backs us up in our belief of better. The black church has been a place within our community that has historically addressed racism and classism, but it has and continues to be woefully silent on sexism, even though the majority of black church goers are women. 
I served as a black church assistant pastor and long-term interim pastor for nearly two decades. And while there, I obtained both a Master of Divinity degree, an earned Master of Divinity degree, an earned doctorate. I was the only female as one of the final three candidates for the permanent position as senior pastor of this Maryland middle-class black church. And despite the overwhelming support from the congregation in the selection process, many things went away. Many things were a little sus. Even though I held the majority of the votes in all four rounds of voting, the percentage still fell 2% shy of the stated number of votes needed. In the midst of all of that madness, I received threats, my car was vandalized more than once on the church parking lot in my assigned space with my name at the space. It got so crazy that I had to retain legal counsel in order to leave halfway whole. But it was the tenacity and resilience born out of my culture and spirituality and selfhood that opened the door and created the opportunity for me to recreate me at the 2.0 upgrade level version of myself because that is what we do as Black women. At my lowest points, and I'm about to sit my little tail down, at my lowest point of a two plus year stressful process, one day I got a reminder from my mother who was born and raised an East Baltimore girl with black magic flowing in her, with black girl magic flowing in her before the phrase was ever hashtagged. The mama matriarch had to remind me of cultural nuances right here and right here. And if any of you that are listening, watching virtually, or even sitting in the room are not from Baltimore, let me tell you this. You are either from Baltimore or you from East Baltimore. Now I grew up in West Baltimore, but that, that was the idea and understanding that I grew up with. So in the midst of all of the cray cray crazy I was going through, I was curled up in the bed, ready to give up. And my mother, God rest her soul, said to me, amongst many things she said that day as I was preparing for a very tense church meeting, don't forget your roots. And before I could inquire exactly what she meant, I didn't know if she was talking about my daddy. I didn't know which route she was talking about. She said to me, in the midst of that overwhelming struggle, while I was in the midst of losing hold of my selfhood, don't you ever forget that you've got East Baltimore DNA running through your veins. When you step into that meeting, don't get loud. Don't show out and shout. I don't care if they've already prayed. It's your meeting. Get up and pray again. Use your voice. You are still in charge over there. Then you speak your truth with clarity, control, and conviction. Hold your head up and handle your business because that is what we do. That was the gospel according to Shirley Hayes Hargrove. It was and still is cultural and spiritual gold to me. It got me out of bed, I washed my face, I squared my shoulders, I leaned into my cultural and spiritual underpinnings, 
and I went for broke. That connection helped me to carve out the path for the creation of Bokasi Ventures. It's in your program book, but let me just tell you that Bokasi is a Central African term that means unique energy or presence. And I believe that we all got a little Bokasi going on. It helped me formulate a wellness business, a voiceover business, and the celebration, not merely the toleration of my own doggone self. There is extreme power with the elders. The elder community in the black community and in the rest of this world is the most looked over segment of our population. Respect them. Honor them. Respect yourself, honor yourself. When your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions are well, when you are culturally connected to who you are and whose you are, you will be formidable, unstoppable, creative, and intuitive. You will own your story proudly and claim your space in this world authentically on your own terms. And you will keep rising, reflecting, and making a difference while you embrace the South African spirit of Ubuntu, which captures the idea that I am because we are. It is best explained by African philosopher John Mbiti, but I've taken some license with it today to make it germane to black women. Only in terms of other people does the individual become conscious of her own being, her own duties, her privileges and responsibilities towards herself and other people. When she suffers, she does not suffer alone, but with the corporate group. When she rejoices, she rejoices not alone, but with her sister, girlfriends, her neighbors, her relatives, and those in her circle. Whether living on this physical plane or the plane of the ancestors. And that is why it is well with my soul. Thank you much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Hargrove, for that very stimulating conversation. I'm going to give Dr. Sheffy the mic. There's a relative she'd like to acknowledge. Thank you. Wasn't that marvelous? Wasn't that a marvelous, marvelous? It was what I'd hoped for. It's what I wish more students were here. It's what I'd hoped for. Yes, you did a beautiful job. I can't forget my granddaughter-in-law, whom I did not introduce. But she's here. And I want you to meet Morgan Rawlings. That's Morgan Rawlings, the mother of my two great-grandsons. Juan Mandela, how old is Mandela? Three, and Mark and Marshall. Marshall is one, is one. So we can't forget her, had to introduce her, yes. That was marvelous, wasn't that marvelous? Marvelous. Oh. I see she took her own Bokasi in this moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeff, for like it, exercising that energy. We have a few minutes for questions, and I do have microphones. I'll, I'll ask Dr. Johnson to be um, possible. You heading up? Okay. So I'm going to ask, oh gosh, any students in the room are going to? We have two microphones. We have moments for questions. But I wanted to just start once again, because I, I dabbled in divinity. So I, I was very aroused by this presentation. But I want to bring it back to some literature. So um, I'm going to give Dr. Hargrove this mic so she can answer from her seat. But there's a new book that just came out called God is a Black Woman by Christina Cleveland. And a lot of what you were talking about is very interesting, because in that book she says, imagination is theology. So I wonder if you can kind of uh, exegete something on that in regards to the idea of the selfhood 
and self-awareness and self-care that black women are woefully in need of in terms of medical conditions, in terms of giving birth and the, the, the rates of um, maternal deaths. So the idea of this self-care and kind of tapping into this need to step aside and kind of reclaiming yourself in terms of Christina Cleveland's work, if you're familiar with that, and I know you probably are. And then I'll pass the mic to others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for the question. I will say this about what you just stated. Um, we have to be better advocates for our own selves. When you in, engage in, I'm just going to take the, the arena of health care. Um, even the best of doctors don't always have a viewpoint of what you need as a black woman. And so sometimes we find ourselves in spaces, even though we are labeled as strong, we don't always embrace our own strength in a way where we stand up for ourselves. We do it better sometimes standing up for others than we do for our own selves. You know, I tell people all the time when I do, I do, uh, uh, what I choose to call life uh, navigation with people. You might put it in the realm of life coaching. I put it in the realm of being a navigational midwife to help people push to the places they need to be. And in doing so, there are things that we just don't do for ourselves. For example, putting yourself on your own calendar. We put everybody else on there, but unless you are whole in your selfhood, you cannot be of the best benefit to anybody else. Something else that we don't do, you know, I find it very interesting that um, those of us, and I can only talk with with a level of expertise about a Christian context. So that's the context I'm gonna give it to you in. But I find it very interesting that um, as Christians, as church going folks, um, we are some of the most joyless people that I know. Um, we really are. And so I encourage people in, in holding on to that selfhood, little things like whether it is virtual or physical, get yourself a joy jar. And you ought to be able to put something in your joy jar every day. I don't care if it is just you going and buying yourself some flowers, you taking a moment to meditate. We need to put our own selves on our own calendar to be able to embrace what you're talking about. Thank you for that. Oh, yes, Dr. Jeremiah. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Dr. Sheffy. This is Milford. Dr. Sheffy called me Milford. She hired, hired me years ago. So th thank you again, Dr. Sheffy. It's Milford. Good seeing you. <laughs> Waving at you. Jeremiah? Yes, ma'am. Yes. She called me Milford. <laughs> thank you. Just want to, no, yes, ma'am, you did. Yeah. You don't tell that. <laughs> That's part of my joy, joy dimension. That was placed in my joy gift from Dr. Sheffy. Just want to thank the speaker for the interdisciplinary approach to what you did. I usually ask my students, what did you hear that pertains to your major or is larger than what you're here at Morgan for. So again, I want to applaud you for that interdisciplinary approach to what you, you did. I heard co cognitive psychology, I heard sociology, elements of language. So I just want to say thank you within that realm of that larger dimension in which you spoke. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank Do you. appreciate it. Do we have any other questions? Our speaker was marvelous, but she knows what she's talking about. She's talking about the joy in us. Her dear mother passed, what, this year? Last year? She and I, I, I just loved Shirley, but I always met her in the lobby of Heritage Church, where we were members, and we always found something hilariously funny in that lobby. 
Shirley had the best sense of humor you'd ever want to have, so she knows what she's talking about. And we would be so loud and inappropriate in the <laughs> lobby. And finally, we'd say to each other, oh, listen, we can't carry on like this in the lobby of the church. We must be more sober than this. But she, she, she was a delightful woman for humor, and you live up to her high standards. Yeah. We have a question. Hi, thank you so much for, for that. Um, and I am a student, by the way, I'm a graduate student. Um, I have a question um, for Dr. Reverend Dr. Hargrove. You mentioned about the black woman super strong trope, and you mentioned the hashtag black girl magic as a revisionist narrative. Um, and this question might be like really too broad for you. So um, I wanted to know what your thoughts were on how in our search for selfhood, how do we keep hashtag black girl magic from becoming a co-opted trope? Um, is that even possible? Um, and is this in part of creating, which I just learned today, what a tertium quid is about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. And yeah, I, uh, to give a short answer to what you're saying, um, that tertium quid idea is something that I have taken from Dr. Wilmore, which he made specific to African American religion. And I've opened that up to how we function as black women. Um, that notion, the trope of black girl magic still needs to have balance. And in, in order to, to obtain or to grab hold of that balance, you gotta start with identifying who you are, um, beginning to open up and define what selfhood means for you. And it is so important in the culture, the, the broader culture in which we live because we find that reality TV has taken on a life of its own and particularly with black women, the way in which we are openly violent with each other, with our words, with our energy, with our action, that we see played out on television has become um, the new sex. And what I mean by that is, you know, sex, sexuality always draws, but, but this thing about violence with us has become the new sexy sensation. And it is up to those of us that know better to begin to balance that out in how we are showing up in our selfhood. Because there is some power to being uh, a woman that claims some black girl magic, but it needs to be um, done in such a way where there's a balance and, and, and we put some meat on the skeletal framework of what black girl magic is to us. I hope that kind of touches on answers your question. No, you did. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We might have room for about two more questions, and I'm going to take a point of personal privilege with my own mic. To, uh, on the or eve of International Transgender Awareness Day, which is tomorrow, and talking about the idea of selfhood, I think it's very interesting because we look at transgendered persons who are also being kind of drawn into this idea of violence or this idea of theater, or performative behavior that's negative. How do we look at that in terms of literature? as well as social media and kind of re reclaiming this idea of, of what womanhood is or what femininity is according to African-American people. And to that point, Rosetta Tharp, there's a play right now in, in Ford's theater about her. And so the idea of these um, fluid gender persons in our history who we've always known were possibly fluid gender and they existed in their own self-identification. Ma Rainey, you know. And so as a result, now we have language for this. We want to compartmentalize and people want to borrow and kind of lift up certain people, but we've always kind of existed amongst ourselves in a healthy way, I think, for the most part, even with the exterior looking in. So how do we maintain our core self? And Darlene Clark Hine calls it dissemblance, whereby which we can maintain our core selves but still have a public face. Because right. I think our private's leading into our public, and so people are taking advantage of that leak. 
Yeah, no, no question about that. And I think part of what we, we've been seeing recently is uh, those that are discussing the definition of what it means to be a woman. Um, kind of ties into what I, I, I was talking about in regards to not discarding your femininity. Um, I don't think, and, and, and this may not land well with some, but I don't think that um, all things can be dumped into the category of being a woman. Um, there are some, some pieces and parts of how we live our existence being gender fluid that are not going to necessarily always line up with what it means to be, I should say female instead of woman, to be, to be female. You can identify as whatever you feel comfortable identifying as, but again, I think it's a, it's, it's a work of clarity within, and when you're not clear, anything goes. And I think part of what we are missing is some clarity, even about um, the fluidity that we see um, in terms of gender identification and sexuality. You got to be clear before anybody else can be clear in that space. And I think that we do, I think in the black community, whether we have spoken it or not, we've always done for the most part, a good job of accepting all. It's what we do. Whether we're talking about uh, transgender individuals, whether we're talking about um, those who are uh, gay or lesbian and how they identify, for the most part, we, are accepting of that. Where it gets sticky is when in your selfhood, you're not clear about where you are and, and who you are. And then the way that that gets expressed gets confusing for the masses. And I think you, you answered that point. That's very good because we have, we talk about everybody. Yeah, the African-American community, everyone's on the stage and kind of poked upon yeah. that. So as a result, I think now that the language has become more public, we've lost some of that cultural reign we used to have mm -hmm. on it. And mm -hmm. so I, we could talk about that at, at some point in time. I don't want to hog the mic. Question, yes. So um, I have a, a question about once you've made that fundamental shift where you recognize your selfhood, you embrace that pouring as much joy, kindness, love, and attention into your individual self increases your capacity to be able to provide that to your community members, your right. family. How do you balance modeling that behavior and then the very fundamental need to kind of explain it or justify that shift? And so I'm speaking specifically about this shift happened for me postpartum with my second offspring. Okay. And I knew that if I did not make the decision to pour into myself the way I poured into my children, I wasn't going to be able to survive because I mm -hmm. had watched the women in my life run themselves almost into the ground in order to provide for the people that they loved and that they cared for. But when you tell people, you know, I'm going to take care of me, you know, before I take care of my kids, mm -hmm. that the aunties look at you mm -hmm. like you lost your mind. Mm -hmm. so, so then you, how mm -hmm. do you do that? So you know what? <laughs> Let me pull up the chair on this one. <laughs> I need to watch my mouth because I'm in public. I do have a potty mouth. <laughs> Uh, people that know me well know that, so I'm not going to disgrace anybody today. But the way that you do that is understanding, and this is something else that we do as Black women, we explain stuff that we don't need to explain. And you cause yourself undue stress you know how you explain that with the aunties or the mamas, anybody else? I know it ain't you, Alona. <laughs> but you explain that by declaring only when you have to. I can show you better than I can tell you. Period. You don't need to explain you and your need to take care of you 
See, that's what I'm talking about when we talk about that idea of strong. Because in our minds, because it has been overlaid by the dominant culture's view of strong, we start to believe that strong means that I have to etch myself out of my own life in order to take care of everybody and everything else, and you don't, because that's how you're going to wind up stretched out on your back in the hospital laid out somewhere. Give yourself permission to put some value and some worth on you just as you are. Period. Yes, ma'am. Thanks so much for being here. Was this is the seventh lecture? I was here, seventh son of the seventh. This is the seventh daughter of the seventh daughter. <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. Yeah. We have room for two more questions, I believe, at this juncture. Yes, we have one down front here. He's coming with the microphone. Like. Hi, this isn't a question. Actually, it's an announcement. The women gender, uh, women gender sexuality studies program, uh, the actual last program of Women's History Month is tomorrow at five o'clock in BSCC 100. Every year we acknowledge Transgender Day of Visibility. And I would like to invite you to join us for a very important discussion tomorrow. Thank you. Shameful plug. And I, I will take another point of personal privilege about Zora Neale Hurston. So the fact that she models all of what you're talking about, and Dr. Sheffy brings her into our consciousness here as a Morganite herself, I think she lived that self-awareness. And she suffered for it. So can we talk about the suffering of this? Because it's always not rosy. I think once you get past, like we're over 35 now, right? So once you get past 35. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> the clock stopped at 35, but go ahead, Dr. All Jones. Right. Well, I'm over 35. <laughs> and so I think when you, you realize you don't have to apologize. And so then you realize I have to walk this alone. And then I'll find my spirit sisters in this walk because there's going to be others who also have that. So I'm wondering in terms of that, can you kind of look at the other, this kind of, I don't want to call it dark side, but this kind of the, the wrestling with the gang as you kind of maybe are actualized and others are not because they still want to people please. Right. So you're willing to swallow self yeah, right. to fit. How does that look? Yeah, so that it's a process. Okay. And it's a process because you have to grow to the point of being okay with being in some solitary places along the way. I, I shy away from saying being by yourself because I think when we get into co honest conversation with each other, we will find more often than not that our that piece of our story is more normative than it is unusual. But we have been trained to keep it in. Part of the 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 dark or the other side of this life that, that we are embracing as people of African descent, particularly in this diasporic region of the United States is, and I know that y'all have heard this in one way or another, what happens in this house stays in this house. And we internalize that many times to mean what happens in this house is supposed to stay in this house. And it is a farce because the exact opposite is true. When we have dealt with emotional, spiritual, and other types of trauma, that resonates about what happens in this house stays in this house. But the truth of the matter is, even when we go through trauma and drama, and we are like this with our trauma and the things that make us feel not so good about ourselves, not talking about it keeps us like this with whatever it is. And what gets 
understood as you go through your process is the more that you were able to give voice to it and to yourself, you and the trauma start to do this and then do this and then do this. And it's not that the experience goes away when you are trying to find your footing in your selfhood but you, it gets further away from you so it is not guiding you, so the darker side is not guiding you and you, you got to give way to the light. Remember, light cancels darkness. So you got to be able to let that light in in that way while you are in process. Thank you. One qu question, yes, ma'am. Yes, my question is... Why is it, or why has it always apparently been a problem for a black woman who deals with circumstances that have occurred in her life, many instances with no fault of her own, mm -hmm. and when you as a black woman decide to do what you need to do for yourself and for your family, mm -hmm. it's always a negative thing when you're strong, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. And um, and cause people have said to me many times, well, you know, you're just, a, you're just a strong black woman, but it's always like in a negative thing. And my thing is, if, if it is to be, it's up to me. Mm -hmm. And if you consider that a negative, oh well. But I look at it like it's called survival. Absolutely, absolutely. You. And, you know, th there are remnants and cell memory from enslavement that, that, that pit us against each other that still rise up, whether it is colorism within our own circumstances or whether it is the, the notion that we function from that whatever, however big the pie of our existence is with one another and the things that we are reaching for for our own selves. We come from a false understanding that there are only but so many pieces to that pie. So oftentimes when we get um, approached with the negativity about what we do as strong women, it's really those around us that wish that they could do what you do, but don't have the courage to do what you do. So it's more about you than it is about them, about getting yourself again to the place where you don't feel the need to have to explain yourself and coupled with that to begin as you embrace a greater sense of your selfhood to embrace the notion of becoming unbothered by the comments and opinions of others that don't resonate with you. Unbothered doesn't mean that you don't care. It doesn't mean that you're tossing it off. It means I'm not going to allow that soul so deeply into my space that it knocks me off kilter because of what someone else has said. If you're good with you and you've done what you need to do in the strength that you have been given, pat yourself on the back, bless them with life, not life, love, light. And in my terminology and a piece of Jesus and let them be. And you do you, boo. <laughs> There you go, there you go, there you go. And it is done with ease, not with animosity, and it makes it all, all, all right. It makes it all right. Be your strong and let somebody else be theirs. That is a very fitting coda to our conversation. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time here and your thoughtful info. Yes, Dr. Hargrove, thank you. Uh, we will now have the singing of the alma mater by Miss Jayla Way. 
if she will come. And if we don't mind standing for our alma mater here, those who can, please. Devotion by death. 